but um, this is going to be part one of a two-part video. Um, we're going to go over some of the mechanical aspects of this stove as well as the, the surface elements and the controls, how they work, explain a little bit about them, how we test them, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a meter? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't see it behind the tools. Okay, um, but I wanted to point a couple other things out. This is also in the handout that, that you guys have. Um, and then Tuesday, we're gonna have another lecture about six o'clock, same thing. And we're gonna go over the oven controls, self-cleaning, the control board, and all those components as well. Um, Starting off, and if you look at, at the, uh, the handout, let me see uh, one of those copies, please. I can't find it. Um, I'm going to start right here on the handout, and we'll go through some of these things here and explain them, and then we'll get into the schematic and the diagram and stuff like that. Um, the first thing in the, in the upper left-hand corner is talking about something called an anti-tip bracket. And it's this bracket right here on the stove. The anti-tip bracket, if you see in 19 something, or I don't remember the date that actually came out, they were required to provide an anti-tip bracket to all customers with freestanding ranges or ranges that stood on the ground, not wall ovens or something like that. Because what was happening is small children were opening up the door and they were stepping on the door to get inside the cabinet. When you step on the door, this whole stove can tip over like this and sandwich them between the door and the oven. Now it isn't a requirement by law that you install it, but it had to be a requirement that the manufacturers had to provide it when they sold the appliance so that the customer has the option to put it on. Some manufacturers, instead of having this metal bracket that either attached to the wall or to the floor below it, and then when they slid the range back, the back right foot or the back left foot, depending on where you did, where you installed it, slid into that bracket so the foot would get caught, okay? Um, Seven manufacturers, I think it was Whirlpool, they, you know how you, ha how, how, do, how do you see when people hang pictures on the wall? Uh, what do they put? They bracket, put like the, bra the little bracket thing. Little brackets Not on the a back bracket, the frame, what else behind the, behind Wire. the a wire they would have like a wire so like like, right like hung there. yeah and then you hang the nail on the wall mm -hmm. well some manufacturers put a piece of wire from here to here in the back and you would have a hook on the wall mm -hmm. and you would just take the wire and stick it on the hook and it would hold it at the top so as long as it kept the stove from falling over with children mm -hmm. then that was okay so if customers ask you about it you explain to them what it is and what it's for but it's for safety so that um, children don't uh, don't get hurt because children will try to get up there to get them cookies on the top <laughs> shelf you know and, and so forth so if you see this bracket we did install a bracket in the corner of the shop where I have the big giant refrigerators one of my students installed one of those brackets there mm -hmm. so you guys got to pull the stoves out and see how it is and like see how the stove sits in there um, so that's what that is um, the next thing is four wire and three wire hookups. Electric dryers and stoves do not come with power cords, okay? Um, because there was many ways they wired up. When they first had stoves, they hardwired them. There was that flexible conduit with, with wiring in it and they would connect it back to the stove. Um, the other option was to have this three prong three wire cord. Um, this is the wrong cord for this stove. This has three prongs, but this center one is shaped like an L. I tell everybody, remember, if you see it shaped like an L, think of laundry. That is a dryer cord. Mm -hmm. And the reason or the difference between the two is they're both 240 volts, but this is a 30 amp cable. The range is a 50 amp cable. So what so what's different is the wiring inside here is thicker on a stove than it is a dryer. A dryer only usually has one, maybe two heating elements inside, so it doesn't draw a lot of electrical current. A stove has four elements on the top, two elements in the oven, and some of them even have double ovens plus a four. 
So if you turn on all those elements at one time, you're drawing a lot more electricity, you need a heavier power cord. Now it's all right to hook this up like in the shop here for testing, if you want to see if the element works and make electrical tests. But this cable, if it left on and we turned on all of these elements on the same time, we'd cause this wire to burn up and damage the wire. So you have an option to connect a three wire or a four wire because code has changed. Now if you look here, they did state in January of 1996 that stoves were supposed to be wired to a four wire outlet. And what happens is, um, on the stove, you have what you call line one, neutral, and line two. And a three wire cord would have line one coming in here, line two coming in here, so this is line one, this is line two, and neutral would go to the center screw. Now if you see, this is the same thing here, but they did something different. You see where it says ground wow. screw right there? They actually had a metal bracket that went from here to here, the metal bracket was like this. Mm -hmm. And it was screwed here and screwed here and the bracket was like bent. And so neutral and ground, the, the frame of the machine, neutral and ground were the same thing. And that's how they grounded the stoves. But what would happen is in the wall, if this, you'd also see like this, like here, let me uh, put a chassis, whoops, put a chassis ground symbol here. So neutral and ground, the same thing. If this neutral wire was to break, there could be voltage to the appliance and someone could touch it and get electrocuted because neutral and ground were the same thing. And if we lose that neutral wire on this cord here where it doesn't make it back to the power supply, then it makes it unsafe. I've been in customers' homes where they've touched the stove and the refrigerator was right next to it or the sink was pretty close by and they happened to touch both at the same time and they actually received an electrical shock of 120 volts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's probably due to the cord not being hooked up. So when they sell these appliances, both dryers and stoves, even before they changed the code, they never sold it with a power cord. The customer had to buy a cord. Um, I've had one guy, a salesman at Best Buy, I was, I was working for Best Buy and I needed to buy an appliance for my home, so I needed to buy a stove. And the guy's like, oh, do you need a cord? I said, no, 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 I'm gonna take the cord off the old one. The guy goes to me, no, 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 if you use the old cord, you're gonna void the factory warranty. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put an old cord on there and that cord's defective, that could cause it, but it's not gonna void the manufacturer's warranty. I told the guy, listen, I work yeah, for service. Yeah, because we don't even know if you're gonna do that, right? Well, he's gonna sell you a cord because he's told to sell you right. a cord. Mm -hmm. But what cord do you need? Do you have a three-wire outlet, four-wire outlet? Most customers don't know what the outlet is behind their stove. Mm -hmm. The average customer doesn't know what it is. Um, could you do me a favor, Ken? Mm -hmm. in, in the, other, the other end of the room there, I have mm -hmm. those milk crates. Get me a four-wire plug, a big, heavy, black uh, cord. And I just want to show the difference. Let me just loosen these up. There's a milk crate on the floor. Okay, that's it, perfect. Okay, take this one, take this cord off of the stove for me for a second. So, just loosen them and then pull it, pull it out. So this is a four wire. Is this a range or a dryer cord? What do you guys think this is? Is this a range or a dryer? A range. Range. Why? Because there's a four prong. Well, no, because a dryer could be four prong also. Not that on it. Both dryers and ranges now by code should be four wire. Thank you. You may see. The difference is that center prong is L-shaped. This one is. Flat. Okay. Yeah, you do see. 
If it's a flat one where the neutral is, that's a 50 amp. That's a stove cord. That's a what? 50 amp or 50? 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. Mm. Ranges are 240, 50 amp. Dryers are 240, 30 amp. So the, the difference is we only have three wires here where this one, if you see, has a fourth wire, has a separate neutral and a separate ground on here. So when we're connecting this one, we would just connect it to the three screws in the back. If it was this one, we'd connect the black, the white, and the red to the three screws. This one will be connected right to the frame of the sheen. But they removed that ground strap, and you see there's no ground strap here. So this would have a separate ground. So this will be black, white, yeah. red, and, and then green. Here are the grounds. This one, if you had a three wire, they don't actually color code them. All right, you're like, well, how do I know which one's line, line one, one, line, line two, two, whatever. Line one and line two doesn't matter. You could put the cord either way. Um, this one has four colors, but if you put the red on the black and the black on the red, it's not going to hurt anything, okay? Um, but the white and the green are important that you put them there. On this one here, the center one, there's like, do you see the three lines? There's three separate lines here, okay? So line one and line two are the outside. The neutral is the center. This one here, the white one goes to the center screw, and the green one goes to ground itself. Okay. Okay. Uh, a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard you say that it doesn't matter if you wire it from black to the red to black. Yeah, the power cord but coming in. Did not I think I read where it says that if you do that, sometimes it changes the polarity of the flow of current. No polarity. Polarity would be the neutral. Okay. Okay. Line one and line two are both 120 to ground or neutral. Mm -hmm. Okay, so line one to neutral, line two to neutral, or line one to neutral, line two to neutral. If I switch them, the stove would not know. All right. Okay, because they're both basically the same line of power. All right. So um, this is how you would hook up a three wire cord, and this is how you hook up a four wire cord. So. Here, here is uh, the different straps. Now let's go to the next one here. Oven door servicing operation. The way we broke down the, the range packages is different than when we did the laundry. I gave you one package for the washer and you did all the electrical and mechanical components and everything all at one time. In ranges, I broke it down into three separate categories. You have electrical, you have mechanical, and you have the gas. So we're going to talk about everything that's in that package. And so here, the door. Um, sometimes you have to service the door. The door has a self-clean. This one is not a self-cleaning range. It would have a lock mechanism here. It does have the opening for it. But if you had to take the door off for service, there's these little uh, metal pieces on the hinge that you pull out and they lock the hinge in place. First thing they want you to do is open the door all the way and then push down the, the locking mechanism. So when you go like this, right here is the locking mechanism. You just open it all the way. That one's a little tough. Let me get a screwdriver to get it up. So we just lift it up a little bit until it opens all the way. Once you do that, then you're going to take the door and put it in what we call the broil position. The broil position is actually higher, but now it's hit up against those locks. Once I do that, I'm going to grab it on the sides. I'm going to bring it a little bit forward and lift it up and out. So I tilt it a little forward and lift the door right on out. Now, these little locks here are the pieces that I just did. You notice how I didn't touch it? I was close to it. You've got to be very careful with these hinges because if one of those locks let loose, it can cut your finger really bad, okay? Mm -hmm. Those springs are really, really strong tension, and if you don't take care of that, you can get hurt. Now, some of them have a little hole in the hinge, and you put like a little screw or a pin in the hole that holds that, pit, that hinge in an open position for you to 
uh, to service it. So if the glass was broken or something was broken on the door, that's how you would do it. There, you notice how I just set it in place. There's two little locks underneath. They're underneath here, right about here, that lock that door into position. They're showing it right here. That that indentation goes inside that lock and it holds it. Then all I have to do is just open the door wide up, slide these pieces all the way in. And this one must be bent or something. And then you go like this, and the door is back on. All right. So sorry, Richard. I missed the game pencil and pen and paper. I recorded it. Okay. You can you can watch the recording. Okay. So these hinges just lock and hold the door open for you to take it off and then put it back on. Okay. So here, oven door servicing and operation. So there's a lot of things about this door. One is the airflow through the door. You notice this one has holes in the front. Some of them. The holes are on the top here, and that's to let air flow through the door. And the reason that is, shh. so the reason that that these holes are here is because we want air to flow through the door. So there's holes on the bottom here. They allow air to come in and go through the door so that the exterior panel of the door doesn't get hot. Okay? So... When they're cleaning, this oven gets extremely hot. It's not so much regular cooking, but when they're cleaning with this oven, that oven temperature is approximately 850 degrees. Okay, so there's 850 degrees on the internal part of this oven door. So you'll notice, and, and one of the questions asked when you do the assignment is, why is there so many layers of glass between here and here, some of them have two, three, four layers of glass. And glass is an insulator. Like up in your attic of your house, they have fiberglass. That's to keep heat from getting from the roof into your home. So glass is an insulator to keep the heat from going from here to the exterior panel of the stove. You know, imagine having a one or two year old kid run up and yourself cleaning the oven at almost a thousand degrees. And a kid runs up here and, and puts their hands or face up against the glass. So there is an allowable external temperature about 140 to 160 degrees on most exterior parts of the stove that by code, they're not supposed to exceed a certain temperature because it could burn someone severely if it's too hot, okay? So the problems we have here is if we have people that cook with a lot of grease, grease could splatter, get down in these holes, and then you see trails of grease running down inside the glass. Sometimes it's almost impossible to get that grease out and they have to replace the glass. Why? Because glass is porous. It's almost like your skin. So when it's heated, the pores open up, grease gets inside, and when it cools down, they, they close up again and the grease gets trapped inside the doors. So some of them you can take apart and you can clean them to an extent, but they won't look like a brand new stove after you self-clean them. So um, you have to let customers know if they cook with a lot of grease, you can replace the pieces of glass here for that purpose, but to take aluminum foil or something and cover this so that the grease doesn't get in the door next time if they're cooking, okay? When you say grease, we mean by grease, like a lot of grease? Well, grease, grease splatters. You'll see just like, like a, a line running down. And if you look in some of our ovens here and even some of these used ovens here, you'll see lines of grease okay. running through. What's that noise? That's the crack next door. Well, it's glass. The welding problem, I hate. I'm going to tell that teacher. So anyways, if you have to service the glass, back in the days, they had glass that was specially treated for the temperature, and it had like a little dot on them. When you put the door back together, you had to make sure the dot was facing the oven. Uh, nowadays, it, it doesn't matter as much, but um, that's how you do that. Now, most gaskets don't go 100% around the oven door. So if you looked at the gasket on this one, the gasket's actually on the door. Sometimes the gasket is on the oven, and I'll show you this gasket. Richie, come here. You want to take this door off yeah. this time? Yeah, for sure. So you want to take this lock and lift it up and pull it all the way open? All the way. Now do the other one, the other side, a little tighter on that one. It's a, it's a little bit. 
force it up all the way. Just get a screwdriver right there and use it to pry it up from underneath. Okay. Not the whole thing, just, just that piece right oh. about there. There you go. It's... Now, bring the door up till it stops and hits the stops. Now stand up, and with both hands here and here, grab it. And then bring the door a little bit towards the oven, like this way, and then lift up and out. Slowly, just slowly, lift up and out. And this one right now. Lift, lift the whole oven up. Not that hard, watch, watch, watch. Let me get in there. Go like this, and lift up just a little bit. Not lift it that hard. Alright, try, try to stick it in there and catch it. There's, now look here, look here. There's two holes right there that will lock right on that, that lip right there. So put that in there. Slide it all the way in. Use your knee a little bit to push it in. Okay, now open the door. Open it. Open the door. And see the door is caught now, so you got it. So go ahead and take it off again one more time. Just bring it a little bit, little bit this way and lift up. There you go. To get this side it's caught a little bit. Don't lift so high. There you go. Okay, you just take it off and I'll take care of it from here. So what I wanted to show you here is this is the oven gasket. If you look at the very bottom of the door here, the gasket doesn't go all the way. A lot of people think that the gasket, it's gotta be like airtight. That's actually not correct. You gotta have airflow for two reasons. The main reason is when you're cooking, you have to have convection, natural airflow throughout the oven. When we bake, we use a lower oven in the bake and it creates heat to rise. If we don't have good airflow in the oven, we have uneven cooking, especially if we're baking cakes or cookies or anything like that. So there's gotta be a place for cool air to come in and there is a vent in the oven at the top. When you guys work on it, you'll see the vent comes out underneath here. Um, and so hot air escapes the oven and fresh air is coming in, but it's not like opening up the door wide open where you can't maintain temperature in there. You still have some cool air coming in and some hot air going out. So we have that even airflow inside the oven. So this gasket here does not 100% seal. Yes, sir. You said um, air goes goes through under the panel. Air, not, com air I mean, comes in through that gasketed area at the bottom. Right, and then you said right under the board. I mean, it comes out under the board. Air. That's too good. So there's got to be a, a vent, and it's probably behind this panel on this one, but it, it does escape somewhere in the back here coming out. Uh, in the top of the oven. The other stove, you were asking me, what was this metal panel? And I said, well, you'll see it in the next chapter. That was the vent for the oven. On regular stoves, regular elements, not the glass top stoves, if you lift it up, you'll see a round pipe coming up underneath one of them. That's the oven vent. You haven't worked on the, on the coiled element ones, but they, they have the oven vent underneath. Well, because this is solid glass, there's no place for the oven to vent. Now some of them vent here, and the wall ovens, they have a vent uh, over there. I'm not gonna go over there and show you that now. We're gonna have, those of you guys came in late, on Tuesday we're going to go over the oven and all the controls and everything in the oven. This is more the surface and, and surface controls and how they work. But I'm going through that, that service guide there. Okay, so the cooktop. There's two screws underneath this cooktop. To lift it up, this one has already been removed. There's supposed to be two screws here so you can lift up the top and get to the surface elements. It is hinged. Yes, sir. Oh, here's the oven vent right here. So it comes out up underneath here. I can actually feel it, but you guys can check that out when I'm done. But that's the oven vent for it on that side. So to get underneath the top, you just open up the door, remove the two screws in the front, and you can get up to those surface elements. We'll get into testing them out in a second. All right, let's talk about switches because most of you, you know, this is your first time working on stoves. Some of you are so young, you never actually seen a switch like that for a top of a stove. I know Greg has. Uh, these stoves, <laughs> these stoves uh, here, I had one of those stoves in my house as a kid 
And I remember I was taking appliance repair and I had to fix one of the switches was bad. And I got one of those switches and I took them out and there's like eight terminals there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven on this one. And you're like, I looked at it like, what the heck is this? You know, I never worked on one of these before. But it was actually a dual burner. It had a smaller and a, a larger and a smaller burner. And um, when you press one switch, it was off. The next one was low. The next one was medium low, medium high, high, extra high, or whatever. So each one of those would turn on either the smaller one at 120 or the larger one at 240 volts. Uh, they called that a step switch. They stopped using those switches back in the 70s when they started going to an infinite switch like this one, and then eventually most of them started looking like that one. Those two switches on the right are pretty much the same switch. Let me see if they move this thing so I don't break it or trip over it. And the step switch was to control only the burners, not the oven. Well, the infinite switches or the step switch are just surface element controls. The oven had a typical selector switch with a thermostat, and we'll go over that on Tuesday. So, just for an example, if I show you a simple circuit, if we wanted, like, warm, okay, that's what WN stood for. If we wanted warm, we would close this circuit here, and we'd have to close uh, this one here, WN, and this one here, WN. That's just for the light. So that power would come in here, go to the indicator light in neutral, and the light would come on telling you the stove was on. If we wanted the element to come on, we went from line one, oops, we want that. Went from line one through this switch, through the outer element, through the inner element in series at 120 volts. So we went through both elements, but only 120 volts. So that was like the lowest amount of heat we could do. Now, if we went to medium or high, we just put 120 to one of them, which would make it get hotter. When we put them in series, they both share the voltage, just like the light bulb circuit. You put two bulbs on, they drop, you can get as much heat. So the step switch was a little complicated to follow all these circuits, but um, that's how they used to make them in the 70s. They stopped making them. They went now to something called an infinite switch. And the first sets of infinite switches look like this. And it's like this in the picture. There's two sets of contacts or switches in here. This one is L2 to H2, and this is L1 to H1. So L1 to H1 was here, and L2 to H2 was here. And it's pretty simple as far as what the, what the letter stood for. L1 was line one coming in. That was power coming in. L2 was line two coming in. H1 and H2, that was the heating element. One side of the heating element, the other side of the heating element. So that's line one going to the heating element and back out. And that's what they're showing here. So how the infinite switch worked, this was just a simple on and off switch. When you turn the, the switch on to any temperature setting, this contact would close and complete the circuit to the element. Out the other side is what we call a bimetal switch. And you can sort of see that bimetal inside of this one right here. That's what this opening is right here. And right there, if you look at it closely when you're looking at the stove, you'll see a little wire wrapped around that piece of metal. And when electricity flowed through it, that wire actually created heat and caused this bimetal to warp and open. And this contact here would open, turning the element off. So you had a bunch of different settings. You had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and high. I tell everybody, look at those numbers like as if they're percentages of on time. In other words, if I put this on one, that's like 10% of the time it would have power and the element would be on. 90% of the time it wouldn't have any power. So if I put it to five, 50% of the time the power be on, 50% of the time the power be off. So what this switch is doing is sending power to the element, and this contact would open and the element would stop, and that, that piece would cool down inside there. The bimetal would cool down, it close again, and the element would come on. So as you're turning this dial, this dial was what we call like a cam, and it was an egg-shaped cam. 
So one side was bigger. So depending on how much pressure I put on that switch was how, how much heat it needed to open the contact. Yes, sir. The dials are in the switch. The dials inside of here connected to the shaft. How many dials are in it? Just one dial. Oh, okay. okay. That it has a cam inside of it, and that cam would close these two switches. But the higher you turn it, the more pressure you put on that switch. So the more heat it would have to be inside that switch before it would open up. Yes, sir. So with what he was saying, if there's a cam in there, you could technically go between two and three. The cam, I imagine, is smooth all the way around. Yes, and that's why it's got the name Infinite Switch. Step Switch only had five or six different settings. Low, medium, high, but with the Infinite Switch, if I wanted to go 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, I could go there and it would be just a little bit more increase of heat. So even though it has numbers, you could be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. And every, every little gradual movement of you turning this dial will actually change how much heat comes off that element. So when you have it on high, that was it. It pushed down on both these switches and this switch never opened. The element would stay red hot the whole time it was on. Anything less than the high setting on the dial here and that bimetal would cycle open and closed. Yes, what's your question? No, no. You, you, you answered it. Just yeah, so high, high doesn't let that switch shut off at all. Okay? High keeps both them closed until the customer turns it off. Anything less, and it would cycle. And that's why they called it infinite switch, because it had an infinite number of positions. Unlike this switch here, it just had one, two, three positions in, or, or more. So by looking at that diagram and seeing how it's built, it's a very simple component. It either works or it doesn't. There's no middle ground. Correct. Because I've had some customers tell me on four, it gets kind of warm. On five, it destroys my food. And that, I can't see that happening. Okay. Um, so that just was that a glass top stove yeah, or a regular foil element? Yeah. No, because the infinite switch is going to cycle. So if it was cycling on three, it's going to cycle on four. Okay, so it either works or it doesn't. There's no middle ground. The customer was just a little confused as to how it was going. Now, do you, so if I, something shorts out here, one second, if something shorts out here, I've seen this part of the contact like weld shut. So even if I'm on one, it's red hot. It never, never yeah, cycles. I can just wrap it against the table and put it back in and it's going to work. No, sometimes a short would weld the contact, like an arc weld to contact. Oh. You couldn't even take a screwdriver and pry those You're two together. Yes, sir. Because that same call he's talking about, that was, she said it worked on four, but it didn't work on high. Yeah, that was one of those. And yeah. when I when I tested it, it turned into a situation where I had to explain to her the whole duty cycle. So what should have been a five minute repair turned into a 30 minute lesson on how that worked. Long story short, eventually she was able to accept the response, but she kept telling me, no, that sounds weird, that on three, it barely heats up my food, and on four, my food's scalding hot, almost burning. Well, unless there was something wrong with the infinite switch, I had one customer that had an oven relay. It was black like this, but it only had like this bimetal part in there where the relay cycled it, and it was a wall oven. Mm -hmm. And the customer said, hey, my oven's not working. So I changed the relay, and the oven started working again. Went back a week later, the oven stopped working again. And so, But this time when I was working on the oven, I see a trail of ants crawling out of the cabinet, out of the wall of it. So what happened is the relay got so warm, the ants were going inside the relay and making a nest inside of there. And they were getting stuck in between the contacts, not allowing the contacts to close. So I told the customer the second time, I said, ma'am, the problem is, is your ants are getting in there. You need to get an exterminator. I'll change it this time, but if it happens again, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, this is ba back in the 80s when I was working for Sears. So I came to her the third time. She says, I got an exterminator, this and that. It can't be the ants. There's something else that's causing those relays to go bad. I said, oh, really? So I took her relay, and you see this little metal piece right here? You can take it off on both sides. Even, even this one here, you can carefully open it, but don't open up these. I'll give you a switch if you want to. I, I know Richard be the first one to open it because he's curious to see inside. I got switches. But I took that, that off. Went like this and slammed it on top of a piece of paper and a handful of ants came out. Put the cover back on, stuck that relay in her oven and the oven worked. So she could have something getting inside of it, cockroaches or whatever, 
and, and they're jamming the switch up or causing problems where the switch is not cycling properly. But you know, you don't know until you see, because some of these do have, like that has a gap or an opening where things can get inside of it. That's why pest intrusion is so important, like you were saying. Yeah, like little cockroaches, you've seen those microwaves, they get infested with roaches with all the grease and everything else. Yeah. So yeah. that's how the infinite switch controls the element. So let's talk about these infinite switches and the terminals. These two switches with the terminals are identical. If you look here, this one is line one. I know you can barely see it, but that says L1 right there. Mm -hmm. And this is L1 right here. So this terminal and that terminal, same one. Both line ones get black going to them. And if you look right here, this L1 or this one is that L1 on that switch, that terminal right there. Now, the difference between this one and this one is this the left front right front surface element, this is the left rear and right rear surface element. So they just draw one circuit for more than one element. They didn't draw all four switches and all four elements. They said this one is for the, the left front, the right, right front, the left rear, right rear, okay? So they just put the colors of the wires in there. So line one comes into here. So line one is coming into here and then we're just gonna do the element circuit right now. It comes out H1 right here and goes to the heating element. So H1 being right here, we have a switch inside of this box that looks like this. And then this one goes to the heating element. Yes, sir. So even though they show them together, the circuits are separate. So if one fails, they're not gonna all fail. No, they're all parallel to each other. So each one is individual circuit. Okay, so I can have one burner not working and the rest of the other three would work just fine. Okay. okay, and in most appliances, I would say 99% of the appliances going along with that question, all the loads in the appliance are almost always parallel to each other. The only thing in series with them are switches and controls. For safety. Because the, the motor can go out, but the drain pump could still work. Or the water valve solenoid can go bad, but the motor could still work. So they wouldn't put any of those components in series with each other. And the same thing with those four elements. One element can break, the other three should work just fine, unless there's a power supply problem coming in. Yes, sir. All right. In that line, with that line there, is that the protector? Is that like which, a Which line, sir? The line with the red squig the red squiggly? This one? Yeah. Keep that that, that, that right. line's coming from the infinite switch and going right to the element. So right. it's coming from here and going right to here. Right. I want to know, you see, Within that line, it says protector. Is that like That's a... over here. I haven't got to that yet. Oh. I, I'm going through the whole oh, circuit. All right. Okay. So coming off the element, we do go to something, the protector. I'll, I'll get to that. This is the next slide, okay? And then from the protector, it goes back to H2. So the protector, there's a switch right here. Oops. There's a switch right here. And then it runs back to H2. So on the element, there's a switch. And that switch are these switches right here. That's the protector they're talking about. We also call it a surface limit switch. Now I'm going to show you, I have, I have more slides and I'm going to get into that deeper in a second. So coming off of that is H2 and then H2 to L2. So we have another switch in here. So we actually have two switches in this box. One from L1 H1, <coughs> one from L2 H2, but this one has got that bimetal. So when you turn it on, this one is the one that's opening and closing to control the temperature of that surface element. Then this goes out to line two in the wall, okay? So they call that P1, but it's really L2. I don't know why they call it P1, it's just how GE does it, okay? So I'll get into that protector in just a minute. So that's just the surface element. You've got two lines of power going to the switch. So this is L1 here. This is L2, power coming in. The, that same power is coming out here. So if I wanted to check, let's say, let's say my stove's not working. So I come up here, this element's not working. One of the tests I can make in the back of the stove, on the infinite switch is this black and this red is line one, line two. Black being line one, red being line two. There's 240 volts right here. That's Red line two on one side, and black line one on the other side. So that's the power coming in here. 
And if you see, they're all jumping off of each other. They're not in series with each other. They're just jumping the wire from one to the other switch. Now, line one, line two come here, coming out the switch. If you see this one is brown and brown and white. These two are going to one of the elements. If you look at this one is blue and blue and yellow. Notice how they color code. These two go to the element. Ooh. These two go to the element. If I look at this one, this orange and this orange go to the element. Okay? If I look at this one, this one's got two yellows going to the element. So that would be this wire here and this wire here. Okay? Left front yellow and then left front yellow over here with black. Okay? So those two are like, so if I check here and I got 240 and I turn this switch on, I should be able to check these two brown ones, and if I have 240 here, what does that mean about my switch? It's good. It's, it's good. good. Power's coming in, and power's going out. But my element's not working. Oh, no. Element could be bad. You could have broken wire in between, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's something with two brown wires. If I go here and I look at this element, this one here is the two brown wires right here. That's these two brown wires here, the same two brown ones I just showed you. If I have 240 here and this element's not working, I'm in no good. It could be the limit switch, it could be the element, but if I have 240 here, right now, when you change it, both parts get changed at the same time. No need to make another test. Why would you get 240 here? Because that's what makes this element work. I have to turn the switch on. When I turn the switch on, power's gonna go to the element. Yeah. So that's every element, 240? All these elements run off 240, correct. And one of the job assignments you do, you'll be doing tests. Greg did that the last week or so. They checked elements to it and see how it's cycled and everything else. Uh, you so have a question? With that said, wouldn't a continuity test confirm the infinite switch functional, the wiring functional, all of that, but without having to put 240 live onto it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I always tell people if you can do a voltage test, that infinite switches are really only if making a voltage test is unsafe. Voltage test is very good because let's say you ohm out L1 to H1. I ohm, out, I ohm out this switch, switch checks good. I ohm out this switch, switch checks good. I go up to these two brown wires and they check good. Okay, so I'm saying, okay, everything's good. But what if I not even have power coming into my infinite switch? What if one of the wires that feeds the infinite switch doesn't okay. give me power? I see what you mean. Okay. So always, if you can, check for voltage. I use alligator clips, and when if I can't use alligator clips, if I have to go into this stove here, and I need, okay, I gotta check that red and black wire right there. Mm -hmm. Now here's one of the most important things when you're doing a voltage test. First of all, alligator clips. Well, let's just say I don't have alligator clips. You know, my brother stole them from my, from my thing. One thing when you want to do a voltage test is you want to put the voltmeter in a place that's easily visible when you're making the test. Because one of the problems I see people is someone goes like this, they put the voltmeter here, and they go there and they go like this to do the voltage test, and they're very safe, and then they do this. So what am I doing wrong? Yeah, you got you got yeah. arc it. I'm not watching my hands. You're not watching the meter's hands. moving. Yeah. My hands are moving. I can get hurt. I could I could damage the stove. That from situations like that is that I got used to doing continuity for everything to avoid that problem. Yeah, that well, just means I don't have the right. My meter has a magnet on it. Stick it right there. So when yeah. I'm doing the test, okay, if I'm gonna do a voltage test and I don't have alligator clips or I can't put them on those two wires, because what I usually do voltage is I unplug the machine, I connect my alligator clips. I put my meter there, I plug the machine and make my test, I unplug it, I do the next test. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I do tests like this. I say, okay, let me check power. I'll set the meter in a place where I can see it. I'm just going to do this because I don't have my, my meter with the magnet on it. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to check red and black and see if I got 220 here. The next test is what? I want to check the two brown wires coming out, right? So how can I do that safely? Well, first, let me unplug the machine. Let me do the first two tests I'm going to make, red, red and black, and brown and brown. I want to see power coming in at red and black. I want to see it coming out brown and brown. My switch is going to be turned on. Before I plug the machine in, I'm going to do a test 
like this. Like, how am I going to stick my hands in there? Okay, I'm going to go like this, like this. I know there's no power right now, but that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and, like, dry run. You know, before yeah. a football game, what do they do? They run down the field and pass the ball so the guy knows the game plan. Yeah. So when you're doing a voltage test, you need to know the game plan. So how am I going to test it? Okay, the next test I make is brown and brown. Where are they? Oh, that's here and here. So I'm going to go like this. And look, i got to make sure my hand isn't touching these wires while I'm doing it. So how can I do it safely? I'm going to go like this. And then I can take it off and I go like this and like this. And that's my second test. Notice my meter is right there in my face. So when I do this, I don't have to move my head. I just glance my eyes and the meter will tell me the voltage. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to design a voltmeter, Delio, since you like to design things. Why not have a voltmeter tell you? 240 volts, 128 volts. There actually are some that speak, but they're one, the voice is horrible, and two, they're crazy expensive. Get the get the lady from uh, the, Siri. <laughs> yeah, Siri. Uh, Siri, what's the voltage? You have 240 volts. Okay, but anyways, do a drive run. Plug the machine in, then make your real test. Make sure that whatever test you do, your hands are are, are in a clear, safe place. So if I have two four in these brown wires, where do they go? They go to this plug, and this plug goes to my elements. I've seen these terminals here where one of the wires gets burnt. So his ohms test on the two brown wires would check that element. Mm -hmm. So I could go here on these two brown wires like this. I'm going to put this meter on ohms. And I'll put the meter up like this again. The wires came off, so I have to connect it back again. And then, if I just check these two brown wires right here, this one and this one, and I got a reading of 40 ohms, 40 something ohms. So okay. that tells me, tells me what is good. What is it telling me on those two brown wires? It tells you the elements are good. Okay, but which element am I testing? You're testing the 1500-watt one, which should be 36 ohms, which is about what you were pulling. Okay, well, I'm either checking the left rear or the right rear element. Mm, okay. Well, and how did, I, how did I come up with that? Because... It produces leaf. The, no, power. because if you look, at, if you look at, at this one here, this left front elm is yellow or black. I mean... Oh. Right front is blue. The left the rear is orange, the right rear is brown. So which one am I testing? Yeah, the rear. The right the rear. Because the, because the brown wires. The BR. What do you yes, see? sir. He did. Right. Okay, do what two color wires? wires was I testing there? Brown and brown. Oh, brown and brown. Do you wow. see brown here? No. You see yellow, blue, blue. orange, oh, brown. Black. BR. And which element is that? RR. The R right, right, right rear. Right rear. rear. So okay. I know which element I'm testing by the colors. But not only am I testing the element, but what also did I test? The protector, the limit. The surface limit yeah. switch, or they call it the protector on this one. This one's more of a generic question, but because you've been in the industry so long, they always reference it, like if you're looking at the machine, right? Not from the service technician position, which is behind the machine. No, it's always like from the front of the machine. That's correct. every single time. Yeah, okay. almost like automotive people, like left side, right side of the car. Are you talking about when I'm standing in front of the car? Or I'm driving the car. Yeah. You know? yes. um, so, anyways, I'm checking that element for continuity right here. So I got voltage. I could also ohm it out mm -hmm. from these same two wires. So. So what would have been the difference from the voltage test to the continuity test? What's the continuity test tells you whether there's the voltage. a path oh. through a part. Voltage is telling you if that if electricity is at that point. Okay. okay. That the switch has got power going to it. Switch has got power coming out of it. So voltage is telling you electricity. Continuity is just telling you is there a path from one side to the other because if a switch is open, you have no continuity. If a heat element is open, you have no continuity. Okay? So, a temperature limit or hot light switch. We got two switches attached to that element. I've always wanted to know how that works. The hot indicator? Always. But I look at the diagram and it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. 
So if you look here, there's four terminals on these switches, okay? There's three wires and there's actually a terminal here on this switch. On the diagram, those two switches you would think are right next to each other, but they're not. One of those switches is here, okay? And we were doing the right rear, so let's, let's just focus on the right rear for, for a sample. So the right rear is this one right here, and the right rear was this protector right here. So this switch and this switch is inside of this box that's attached to your heating element. Now look at those two switches in the diagram. Look at those two switches in the diagram. What can you tell me about those two switches? This one here and this one here. What's, what's, what information could you tell me by looking at the diagram? Yes, sir. One of them is normally open and one of them is normally closed. Okay, so this one is open uh -huh. and this one is closed. So let's start with the closed one first. The closed one is in series with the element. So power has to come in, go through here, go through that switch and come out in order for that element to work. And they call it a protector because sometimes someone might put a pan on there with grease or an, a, a pan and leave it on and the baby cries or something, they go run away from it and they're not paying attention to what's on top of the stove. That stove can run away and get super, super hot and cause a flash fire, some grease fire, or, or something. So that protector, even if it's on high, if it's on high for too long, that protector can open and you will see this element turn off. Some customers might complain that they put it on high and even though they're cooking on high, they're cooking on high for a long period of time and they're seeing this element get red hot and then shutting off and red hot and shutting off. Depends on how long they're cooking and what they have on there because if they have a big enough pot with water or something, it absorbs a lot of the heat, okay? But if they run away from it and there's no heat being absorbed, a lot of heat comes down here. So the one contact that is normally closed inside of here will open and shut this element off. It's not permanent because once it's off, it'll cool down and come back on. But the customer will say, hey, wait a minute, I have it on high. How come it doesn't stay red hot? You know, why does it go on and off? Well, it's a safety because we don't want this glass to break. If this glass breaks, the pot's gonna fall right into the heating element. So it's the same thing like those refrigerator uh, burners that come out similar to this uh, stove. It has like a little thing on it. And like if you oh, press down. No, that's that's something there. That's a thermistor. Okay. Uh, you had a question? What, what? How hot does it have to get for the protector to... I don't know the exact temperature because it gets extremely hot. But if it gets too hot, it'll shut the element off and the element will come so back on. Over 300 degrees? What? The AC trip. I have it off so that the, the recording doesn't oh, pick it up. Can we discuss that uh, thermistor thing later on? Uh, later. Okay. okay. So that switch opens, we'll turn this element off and uh, pre prevent prevent it from overheating. Now the other one here, if you look, the infinite switch, this contact and this contact are inside of this switch. If you look at that other switch on there, you only have one switch. Are there any switches before or after the light besides no. that one? No. no. So when you turn it on, after about 20 or 30 seconds of it getting hot, the contact on here that's normally open, which are these two smaller ones here, that contact will close due to the heat and it'll stay closed until it cools down. So we have two switches in there, one that's closed, that if it gets too hot, it'll open and stop the element from working. The other switch has nothing to do with the element. The other switch is in there, almost like it's two thermostats next to each other, mm -hmm. one controlling the element and the other one just turns the light on. So when you're done cooking and you turn this off, power from here, doesn't go to the hot cooktop. Imagine if you're cooking and you made something to eat and then you finish and you went outside in the backyard and mom came home with groceries and she wanted to go set it down the stove and didn't know you just cooked. Yeah. So the hot light will stay on until the surface of the glass cools down enough. It can still be quite warm, 
but it, it does prevent you from burning yourself. Quasi. So the hot light was in series with what you said? Well, just, just the switch itself underneath the glass here. Just the switch. Just this switch. So in other words, you turning this on or off has nothing to do with the hot cooked top light. So, one, one second. So if you go to someone's house and this light is on, but all these are off, it doesn't matter what these are. It's one of these switches here, the contact is stuck closed. That happens a lot. Now you just have to figure out which one, because you only have one light. Some stoves have four lights. And so what I just do is I unplug one wire, check it for continuity. Uh, this one's open. Whoa. And then I would go to the next one. Unplug one wire and check out for continuity. Now, if you look, they're all parallel to each other. So if, if this switch here was closed and I'm putting my meter here and here, what kind of reading would I get? Because Infinity or, or closed? Closed. Closed. Why? Because it's parallel and the meter would read through that one. So that means in that situation, instead of testing anything, you could just unplug the feed lead for each one until the one you unplug turns it off. Yeah, but you, you, you're talking about doing it live to see if the light comes off and unplugging a wire that's live and holding it in the air True. and reconnecting it is dangerous. Now, you can unplug the stove, pull that wire off, plug the stove back, but if you're already unplugging a wire and the stove's off, just do an ohms test on each one and in 30 seconds you can check four terminals. I'm sorry, what was your question? You said do a ohms that. check on each one, and then you'll be able to find which, if, which... If I take one wire off of this switch and then touch these two, I'm not checking anything else but that switch. And then if I don't get a reading, I put that wire back, and then I'll take this wire off and then do it. And I'll take this wire off and check each switch individually. And if they don't have the right amount of ohms... It's either then... open and no reading, or it's zero. And if it's zero, it's not supposed to be when it's cold. And that will make the... That'll make the, that, that hot cooktop light stay on. Uh, whether hot, it's open or closed. No, if the switch is closed, that light is on. Okay. But it's not supposed to be closed when it's... Can you put that on mute, please? <laughs> Just put it on mute. So if it's open or closed, if it's closed, that light's on. Okay. But it's not supposed to be closed when it's cold. It's only closed when it's hot. Once someone's done cooking, I've had people call me and say this light's on and I'll ask them, well, did you use the stove today? No, I haven't used a stove since yesterday, but the light stayed on since yesterday. One of these switches got stuck. And you have to replace the whole burner with the switch. That's what I was gonna ask. Can you tap it and see if it loosens? Yeah, but if it's stuck once, yeah, it's gonna do it again. probably stick again. So just change the switch, the element in the switch and get it done. So if it's in the situation of a COD call, you have to tell the customer an entire burner has to be replaced. But that's the way it is. Back in the day, they used to sell these separate, okay? That this has two screws right here. But right now, this is, this is welded together. It's electrically arc welded together, this, this terminal, so it can't slide out. But back in the day, you used to have a little piece of wire and you could slide it out, put it back. But the problem is on the other end of this, let me see that flat screwdriver, please. So this little piece has this glass rod running down through it. Oh. And that glass rod is spring-loaded. That would be impossible to ship. So if you were able to take this apart, you could slide the glass tube out with the switch and then slide it back in, no problem. But that glass tube's easily broken. So guys would order this and by the time they got to the customer's house, this glass tube broke, they'd have to order another one. So how does this thing work? Well, this metal rod, my drawing tool, this metal rod here is running inside of the glass tube. Okay? And then you have a box here, and at the end of this rod, there's a spring, but when it's in the glass tube, they're stretching the spring tight. So the rod wants to slide 
backwards like this, but the, but the glass is keeping it. So when the element gets hot, the glass actually bends a little. And if it bends just a little bit, it's enough to close this contact. When it cools down, the glass pushes it back out. Interesting. If it gets too hot, the glass bends more. And so we got two switches in here, one that's closed and one that's open. The, the one that, that was open closes real easy. But the other one that opens, it takes a lot of Heat to push from that metal piece. But when it cools down, this piece, instead of bending like this, is straight. What part bends? You remind me of the... the glass tube itself. There's a glass mm -hmm. tube running on the outside of this, this piece here. Okay. There's a glass tube and then a metal bar, and it's clipped on one end. The spring is inside of here. I don't want to open this up. People try to do this, but then they break it and damage the element. So um, that's pulling the metal rod back. But when that glass tube bends, the rod can move just enough to open or close the contacts. Okay. So the elements, how they work and, and what they do. This is the standard element here. And if there's a breakdown cutaway where you have the metal casing on the outside, insulation inside, and the actual wire running inside the insulation that is carrying the electricity. So if you were to turn on an element and touch the outside of the element, you wouldn't get shocked. You'd get burnt, but you wouldn't get electrically shocked. Okay? The wire inside is getting so hot through the insulation and through that metal is causing it to glow red hot. Okay, there's little insulators on the very end here that keeps that wire from touching the outer casing. When they manufacture these, they have one terminal attached to the wire, and this tube is just a long straight tube. And they have the terminal in the air, and they hold the tube, and they let the wire run down through the tube, and they grab the other end of that wire, machine does, and holds it tight. And then... On one end, they shove in the insulation while it's straight, and they pack that full of insulation so that this wire stays perfectly centered from the outer casing. Once that's done, they got a machine that takes and bends and coils it, and then stamps it flat. Oh, that's why it's flat, or slightly flat on one side. It's flat on one side for what reason? So your pan can sit flush, and you have more surface area to yeah, more surface heat. area. Because if it's round and the pan's sitting on it, it sits just very little bit on the surface area and actually loses heat where the element don't touch. But if they make it flat on top, they can conduct more heat. Okay? So the coil burner, which is this element here, that actual piece that you see here is actually carrying electricity. So if you touch this, not only would you get burned, you get electrocuted. It's not insulated like a piece of wire. So that actually is an open air element. So which one of these elements do you think would actually work better? Because if you look, we got a lot more coils closer together than we do here, right? And you can see how yeah, when it gets, gets more even up, heating on that one. Gets more even heating, okay. I'd say the top though. Yeah. Because it like it goes all around. Well, I don't everywhere. know the I don't know the true answer to it, but it looks like it would take way more guts to heat that up than the little wire. Uh, well, it's the same little wire. If you looked at it's just a little wire running inside of the metal okay. one. Okay. But, first of all, look how deep inside of this insulation that that element is. It's yeah. a lot farther away from that glass. Second of all, what did we say glass is? It's an insulator. It's an insulator. So this has to get so hot that the heat has to pass through glass, has to heat up the pan. And when you're cooking, you're not actually cooking with the element. The element is heating your pan. And that's why it's, it's important to have good quality pans for cooking because the pan gets so hot, your cooking is actually done by the metal pan. It's not done by the element. The oven is more like the element is heating it up in the food directly through air. 
But through this, it has to go through the glass, heat up the pan, and then the pan heats up your food. So having a nice thick bottom pan takes a little longer to heat up, but once it gets hot, it creates a more even and better quality cooking uh, surface. So this is just the two different types of elements that you normally see. Now the question you had about the, the one that had like this little spring-loaded piece in the middle like mm -hmm. that, that is a thermistor. Mm -hmm. And when you put your pot down on top of it, it senses the temperature of your pot. So that some of these elements, and I, I haven't seen the control, is the control look just like this? Yeah. Okay. Now, most of them, instead of looking with numbers, and they've had these back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. They had them with that little spring little piece in the middle. Those weren't numbers. Those were actual degrees of temperature, like 170, mm -hmm. 200, 300, whatever. But by having that sensor in the middle, it gave it a more accurate cooking. Like if you're cooking candies, or sugars or something like that, you can't go over a specific temperature. If you're, you're heating up milk. You, you want to heat up milk, but you don't want to burn the milk. Right. So those sensors in the middle, usually you have a, a temperature dial, like an oven temperature, they, they more accurately tell the control what the temperature is instead of it working off the amperage of the element and cycling this bimetal open and close. But customers don't want to hear, like normal customers that don't cook candy, they're like, my burner doesn't work. And you know, it's been, I've been to it and it's been recalled multiple times and it's a customer education. Well, I don't know what temperature, I mean, what numbers, what degrees, yeah. I haven't seen the newer stoves that come out. Yeah. Um, but you know, the only way to really, to tell them the difference is get one of those pocket thermometers that go up to like five, 600 degrees or whatever. Put it in a pan of boiling water and change the temperature. So tell the customer, look, I'm on medium and this is the temperature. I'm on seven or eight, the temperature's hotter. I'm on three or four, the temperature's lower. And they can't argue because they don't know the temperature of the foods really yet. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you need to measure the temperature of something that they can see. And one of the ways to not argue with the customer, I did this with central air conditioners. The customer says, my AC is not cooling. Well, you know, you all had Windows ACs at one time or another in the house, mm -hmm. and the ACs were about yay big or whatever. The newer ACs are high efficiency, so the coils are larger than the old ones. So you could have a 12,000 BTU AC or an 18,000 BTU AC. 18,000 is bigger. A 12,000 BTU AC is this big, but a high efficiency 12,000 BTU is as big as an 18,000. So the person who doesn't know about air conditioning will, will measure the AC in their house and said, oh, it's, it's one foot by two foot, and they go into Brands Mart or Best Buy or Home Depot or whatever, and they measure one foot by two foot, that'll fit in the wall, and they put it in the wall, and the AC's running and running and running and doesn't cool the room. Thank you both. And they're saying, this AC don't work. And you're like, well, the size of this room takes a two-ton air conditioner, you have a one-ton air conditioner, 12,000 instead of 24,000 BTUs. Mm -hmm. But how do you tell the customer they got, the, no, no, but the one that was in there fit in that hole. And you see, and this is how, this is how you do it. You don't tell them they got the wrong air conditioner. Not till after what you tell them, say, okay, I'm going to do a couple of tests before I even turn it on. First test, I'm going to check the temperature across the coil. I check air coming in, air coming out. I want a 15 to 20 degree difference. It's 80 coming in. I want 60 coming out. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the cover off and I'm going to feel the front coils of the AC. Down here in Florida, the humidity is so high that that whole entire coil should be cold. And not only that, but it should be soaking wet with the humidity that it collects on there. So you tell the customer, listen, if this air conditioner is doing the best it can, I'm looking for a 15 to 20 degree temperature difference, and I'm going to check the coils and see if they're cold and wet. So now you do your test and you show the customer, look, I got 80 coming in, I got 60 coming out. There's that 20 degree split I told you. You told them that before you turned it on. Mm -hmm. The same thing, feel the coils. All the coils are soaking wet and they're all cold. It's full of Freon, there's nothing more. You bought the wrong size. But if you don't tell them before you make the tests, they're thinking you're making something up. Yeah. But if you tell them what you're testing for before and the outcome you're looking for, if that outcome shows, the customer can't argue with you. And the same thing with the stove. 
You're going to say, oh, you, you don't think that if you change the numbers, it's changing temperatures. Okay, we're going to put a pot on there. We're going to put on low. We're going to put on a couple different settings, and we're going to see if the temperature changes. You could either do a pocket thermometer or a regular thermometer that has a sensor that goes in the water and a digital meter there will change temperature, showing you they're getting different heats. They can't argue with you if you tell them what you're looking for and it shows you that exact result while you're doing the test in front of them. Mm. And plus they'll be like, oh wow, this guy's really smart. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why sometimes when you guys work on these machines, it's not all about, oh, do I have continuity on a switch? You have to know how the piece works and you have to explain to them beforehand what are the good results you're supposed to get so that if you get them, they can't argue with you because you told them before you made the test what you're supposed to get, and it showed you that. Yes? You said that Elliman has a thermistor, right? No, not this one, but there's a, a Frigidaire stove now that has a sensor on it. Um, so it, it would be located here on this, on this unit. Does all the elements have coil connections? But what do you mean, sir? Like, this one? Yeah. The all glass top boxes have boxes do. like this on there. Oh, okay. But I'm saying, dude, it comes with the element. Yeah, it comes yeah. with the element. When you order it. Yes. It, okay. it comes with a whole assembly with the, we call it the surface limit switch. Oh, okay. But it usually comes with that switch. Cool. Okay? So, here is just an example. Now, not every manufacturer does it the same way. We have two sets of switches inside this box. We talked about them. We have one of them is uh, here in series with the, oh, I have a drawing tool. One of them is here in series with the hot indicator light, the hot cooktop, and the other one that's in series with the element. This one's open, that one's closed, okay? So in some of the switches, there's a, the a wire goes here and the switch is here and comes out this way. And then there's a second switch here that's open that comes out this way for the indicator light. So this is line one coming in, going out to the light to neutral here. And this is power from your, your infinite switch going through the element and back out. Now some of them, it goes like this. Power comes in here, the switch is open, and it goes to the light here. And this is line one and neutral, that, that switch this way. And then this one comes from the infinite switch. This is closed and goes to the element that way. So some of them, the switches run this way in the element. Like across here to here, across here to here. And some will run up and down. This one here goes up and down. That comes in here. The switch is open. It comes out here. And this one comes in here, it's closed, and goes to the element. How do I know? On the terminals here, if you look at the terminals, these are bigger terminals here. Look how small these terminals are. Those are for the indicator light. Okay? So you see the smaller terminals here and the bigger terminals here? Big terminals and small terminals. Now, on the back of these switches have numbers. Usually it's 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, but you have to look at the switch assignments. And if we look here, I didn't really talk too much about this diagram. It was on the pictorial, I don't think I have it here. I have it here, okay, on this pictorial diagram here. Okay, that, that switch has two S, H, and four, telling you which ones are, or which and what wires are going to it, okay? So you see the brown and the brown and white. Remember we said the two browns going to that element? Mm -hmm. So that's these two here. These two gotta be for the indicator light. Black and white. Black and white. And if we look at this here, underneath the top, we got the black and white going to the small terminals and the two oranges or the two browns are coming to this one up here. Now when you're changing, yes sir? How did you know, can you repeat that? How did you know that was going to the indicator light? Uh, well, we talked about the two brown wires coming from the switch when we made that test earlier. Yeah. So here's brown and brown. So those number two and number four has got to be actually going to the element. Okay. And then the black and the white have to be going to the light then. 
Okay, okay. Now, if we went to this diagram here, it went too far. It shows fair enough. Right here, brown and the brown going to the switch. And, it shows the switch. and then up here, we should have the black and the white. This is black here and then the white neutral over there. Okay. Okay. Now, can Cook Top gets so hot across the glass? That's if someone leaves it on and walks away from it. But yeah. the cracks are different. A thermal crack is usually just one or two like slides. If it's spider webbed out that's and a bunch of small pieces, that's, that's an impact. Yeah. I had one, one of those happen where the customer kept telling me, no, 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 it, it blew up like that. And then I had to show it to her that no, that wasn't the case. Well, one customer, I remember a uh, tech went to the home and they wanted to change it because it was scratched. He says, listen, I can't change it, you know, because it's scratched. The, the warranty doesn't cover. You used a pot that was very yeah, abrasive here. and damaged it, okay? And the customer said, hold on a second, wait outside for a second. And he came back in and there was a, a crack on the glass. So apparently he set the tech outside and then he took a hammer and went, bam, bam, and then brought the, come here, take a look. <laughs> but you could tell that that wasn't, that wasn't, well, that that might be a, a thermal crack because that looks like a thermal crack. So yeah, because it's just would, a line. Yeah. Warranty would cover this. Yeah. Yeah, because that's considered an imperfection in the glass. Yeah. yeah. Glass could have had an air bubble inside of it or something that caused that thermal crack to happen. The guy looked so depressed when I told him warranty might not cover it. I think I saw that. It was yesterday, right? Uh well, no, that, that's a good way to go about it because you have to cover your bases. I yeah. had a lady who kept asking me about an oven bulb, and I'm like, look. I'm not sure if it'll yeah. be covered. Okay, so on the back of this element, look at all the holes and look at all the numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see they got numbers all the way around. Those numbers are important when you're installing this element. Yeah. This element could be the right rear or the left front or whatever. You want to look at the old one and see the supports and what number those supports went into so that when you put the new one, you have those clips go to the same exact hole. Because if you don't use the same exact hole, we have a pattern on this glass and you could be off just by one or two notches. And so the circle on the glass is here, but the element's over here and you're gonna be, get a call back because you didn't put this element on the glass top. Yeah, yeah. So the holes are lined up by the numbers and the numbers are put on there because this element can be used on five different GE ranges or other ranges and those holes would let it fit on many different configurations. It may not only be used on this one stove. So those holes there, before you take the old element out, look at it. If you look at some of these, uh, this one here, for example, someone took a black marker and marked the two holes. So when they took it off, if they forgot the number, they remembered it. Or you could take a picture and see what number the screws or the brackets went to so that you put the next element on in the same place. Are we gonna discuss induction? Uh, not today. Okay. It's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. I just want to get through this, and we're doing the cooktop, and then on Tuesday we're going to talk about oven, self-cleaning, the locking mechanism, and, and everything else through the oven. So I pretty much went through everything on the cooktop, the switches and the pieces. Then when you guys get to the, the stove, that you can test these and, and go into depth and ask me more questions as you're working on it. Anybody have any other questions about this? So you said you had to figure out what they do and what they're supposed to read, right? You test them, go right. through, identify the diagram and the components. Like this wire right here is this wire right here. Identify where they are on the diagram so the more you can read the diagram, the easier it's gonna be when you have to start making tests. How would you find out where the indicator light when it's not open? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Because you said to find out when it's well, these wrong. Well, two, these two small terminals turn on the hot cooktop light. Okay. So if the light was stuck, you could just put your meter here. If you got a reading, this is bad because it's not supposed to get a reading unless it's hot. So we're not going to get a reading. Not on these two terminals, on these two, yes. Okay. These two are the ones that go in series with the element. And if these two aren't closed, the element won't work. So there's not no manual way to check the hot indicator light, unless it's messed up. The light itself? Yeah. Like if the light bulb don't work? Yeah, I want oh, to okay. be able to tell well, which. If you look at my drawing here, and 
You see how I draw a circle with two lines and a dot in the middle? The dot represents a gas or a neon light. This is a neon light, okay? And you can't check continuity on that type of light. Well, then how do I check the light? You just go to the two terminals of the light, turn the stove on, let it get hot for a minute, should send power to that light. You get 220 volts, well actually 120 on this one. You get 120 volts to that light and the light don't work, what do you do? Change the light. Okay, all right. So those bulbs you can't check for ohms, you have to check to see if there's power to them. Mm -hmm. And if they have power and they don't work, they're bad. If they don't have power, it's so whatever it's, turns it's, them on. It's off. rare that the light itself goes out. Those lights don't normally yeah. break at all. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I have a really interesting one now that you said that. I see here that almost everything operates on line one, line two, which would be... Wait a minute. Let me go to the diagram. Uh, here. I see that almost everything operates on line one, line two, telling me the whole unit is basically 240 or 220 or whatever, except that neon bulb that you brought yeah. up. Okay, so if I plug in a unit that has a knockdown phase, let's say line two is dead. Well, if line two is dead, what would happen? You have nothing to stove to run, but still. No, no, no. What won't run? It won't heat. It won't heat. Anything that is Burn. that needs line two won't run. That's but correct. line one to neutral will. That's correct. So technically speaking, no, because then I just check it at the wall. Never mind. Well, the clock in the oven would work. This this control would light up because it runs off 120 volts. The clock. Okay, so there's no circuit board that runs, not no circuit board. It's very rare to run into a circuit board that's running on 220. Not in residential. Yeah, I, it's just okay. a commercial thing? Just there we go. Not on Good to know. Good okay, to know. so it, it, I, I don't have the... The oven circuit here because I didn't want to like add more stuff to it because that's this is the oven circuit but if you look here line one comes in here black and if you look uh see okay there we got a thing yeah okay here line two if you look neutrals right here and feeds the transformer um from here where's line one line one is here goes here and this one comes back to neutral somehow. Yeah, you can chase it to oven light. Actually, actually this, look, look, do you see a problem in that diagram? There's something wrong with the way they drew that diagram. Mm. Wait, those junctions don't look right. Something's wrong the way they wired the diagram. Mm. Let me uh, let me screen capture this and show you. I just saw it. Where's my uh, we brought in my drawing tool. Well, you could just hit the highlighter button. No, I, I don't like that. New. And I'll just go like this. I want to put it in the other tool because I'm going to use it for Tuesday's lecture. But How much voltage should be coming into that transformer? 120, right? Watch this. I'll start with black. Oop, let me move this over a little bit. Start black as line one. Black line one comes in here, goes up here, and goes to my transformer. Now, wait. I'm going to use a different color for neutral. Watch this. Where does the other side of the oil go? Here's my neutral, and it goes here. That's not the transformer. Hmm. No, no, no. That might be a noise isolator if they drew it like that. That's not neutral. That's actually line two. That's line two. Let me take that off. Neutral's down here. Neutral comes in here, goes like this, and connects directly to line one. Mm. That actually, this line so, yeah. should come to here and feed the primary of the transformer this way. They connected it to line one. They put line one and neutrals directly together, direct short in their drawing. It's a fault in their drawing. Okay, so that's, all right, I see what you mean. That's why I was looking at those dots and I'm like, this, they look like they're jumping. This the wire line. should come here and feed the transformer up here like that. They 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 did an error in their diagram. Hmm. That's that's what drawing. Drawing. Okay. Engin engineers don't always do good, do they? What is your transformer? <laughs> Transformers on the it's on the board right there. Oh, it's on the board.
I'm gonna stop here. I'm not gonna go too much deeper. There's a that transformer. Little, little yellow one. Is this little piece right here? Remember, the board itself does not run off of 120. Doesn't run off 220. 120 comes into the transformer. The transformer lowers the voltage. There's usually two voltages on a board. One is the LED lights, which is a very, very low voltage circuit right here. And the other one is the coils of the relays and the logic of the board. So you usually have like, like a three volt for the LEDs or something like that. And you probably have like a 12 volt for the relays to make the coils close the relay switches. And we'll talk about them uh, on Tuesday. AC. No, all AC. Uh, all AC. That's all AC. Good for Yeah, whenever it's AC and DC. Mm -hmm. Like all right, but we'll get into the circuit board on Tuesday. Okay. All right, good lecture, Richard. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs>